Okay, hello everyone. My name is Courtney Welton Mitchell, and I'm a research associate at the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. In my role with the Natural Hazard Center, I've been fortunate to be able to work with the teams funded through the Mitigation Matters Research Program, 19 teams. I'm pleased to be welcoming you all today to this webinar as part of the Making Mitigation Work webinar series. This is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible with the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and National Science Foundation. This webinar series highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and as you will hear today, research. Um, before we begin the presentations, I just want to announce a few housekeeping issues. One is the forum is being recorded and you'll be able to find that later posted to our website. Um, you can also find previous recordings um, under past recordings. And we're going to be dropping links into the chat. So you'll see, for example, where you can find the online slides, where you can find the previous webinar slides. And if you attend this webinar for the duration, please contact us at the email that's being provided in the chat to receive your certificate of attendance. Please specify whether you hope to obtain credit. We have this excellent feature in terms of continuing education credits from a SFPM or IAEM. So if you can specify which of the two that you would like credit for when you send the email of um, notifying us, again, this is to the hascenter at colorado.edu email, that's H-A-Z-C-T-R at colorado.edu. Specify which of the two you would like to obtain credit from if you attend this webinar in its duration. Um, please also note certificates are made and verified by hand. So our processing times are gonna depend a little bit on the volume. Um, and additional information about this opportunity is available again at a link provided in the chat around the continuing education credits. So I would just like to highlight once we begin our presentations today, you'll see that there's both the chat feature and the Q&A feature. We'd like you for the questions in particular to the presenters to use the Q&A features. So today our presentations are focused on policy research from the Mitigation Matters Award Program. You're going to hear from three presenters, um, actually three teams and four presenters. The first is Chung Wang, Virginia Tech, What Drives Hazards Mitigation Policy Adoption, FEMA's Property Buyout Program in Virginia Counties. Next, we're gonna hear from Sherry Brocka bender and um, Ronnie Schumann, University of North Texas. This is a presentation on From the Ashes, Mitigation Policy After Wildfire in California. And then finally, you're going to hear from Divya Chandrasekhar, and uh, she's from the University of Utah, and she'll be talking about does, does post-disaster recovery funding promote mitigation in small businesses? So um, we have a lot of supporting materials, in addition to the presentations that you'll see today, again, the webinar will be recorded. You can also visit Natural Hazard Center webpage to read each of the speakers' bios, and you can find their associated research reports and research briefs. Again, these are links that are going to be dropped into chat as we continue throughout the program. Anytime I mention a link, you'll be able to find it in the chat. Each presentation will be about 15 minutes, and a reminder, any questions for presenters, please use the Q&A box. Please indicate who your question is for. Um, presenters may have the time during the webinar to answer your questions directly. And if so, they'll do so using that Q&A feature. Otherwise, we're going to collect them and we're going to have a Q&A at the back end. And for any questions we don't get to, we will actually follow up with the presenters and get an answer for you and post all of that information to the Natural Hazard Center website. So thanks to the presenters. Um, and now over to you, Chung. Thank you, Kathy. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes? Great. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to share my research with you. Uh, my presentation title is What Drives Hazard Mitigation Policy Adoption, FEMA's Property Buyout Program in Virginia Counties. 
My name is Chung Wang. I'm a PhD candidate in planning, governance, and globalization at Virginia Tech. Uh, Dr. Yang Zhang is my advisor, and Ms. Owen is the community coordinator in this project. Uh, I chose to study <clears throat> flooding mitigation policy because flooding is among the top three most uh, common natural hazards in the U.S. Uh, the First Street Foundation found that 14.6 million properties have substantial flood risks across the country, uh, which could cost uh, a lot of money in insurance claims. So the property buyout program as a flood mitigation tool uh, gained more and more uh, attention in recent years. Through this famous property buyout program, residents in high flood risk areas can sell their um, properties voluntarily to local governments. And then local governments uh, need to demolish the properties and transform the land into open space permanently. Uh, so you can see that uh, local government uh, is playing a very important role in this uh, policy adoption and implementation processes. Uh, so far, uh, although there is a green body of research on the property buyout program, uh, however, there are only 58 peer-reviewed articles of the buyouts uh, in the U.S. as of 2020. Um, and uh, most of the existing literatures are focusing on the residents' perspectives. And uh, less research uh, from, uh, is from a government perspective. And another research gap is uh, that less research used uh, theoretical frameworks to get their buyout studies. So my research is to explore factors influence the property buyout policy adoption of local governments. The purpose of this study is to understand the factors of hazard mitigation policy adoption at the local level. Uh, and it can also provide theoretical and practical implications for federal, state, and local government officials. Uh, based on the literature review, I developed uh, a new conceptual framework to get my research. There are two categories of factors, including county-level internal factors and external factors. Uh, internal factors are conditions inherent to a locality including problem identification, social vulnerability, and institutional capacity. Problem identification uh, captures the severity of flooding risk uh, in a locality. Social vulnerability reflects uh, how vulnerable the communities are. The institutional capacity include three levels. Uh, they are individual capacity, organizational capacity, and system capacity. In terms of external factors, there are two categories, including policy diffusion and policy environment. Policy diffusion include uh, policy learning, imitation, and competition. Uh, policy environment here uh, refers to the collaborations between governments at different levels. Uh, here are the specific research questions and hypotheses. Research questions are what internal and external factors influence the property buyout policy adoption of local governments. The hypotheses are flooding property damage, social vulnerability, institutional capacity, policy diffusion, and environment will positively affect the buyout program adoption at the local level. Uh, I chose Virginia as my study area because uh, in recent years, Virginia experienced a recurrent flooding and uh, it will have more flooding issues because of sea level rise in the future. And another reason for me to choose Virginia because uh, there are almost 303 buyout projects that have been uh, implemented from 1996 to 2019. And from this map, we can see that some of the counties uh, which have uh, buyout projects are located in coastal areas, and some of them are located in inland areas. So the diverse characteristics uh, of this uh, 
the adapter and the non adapters uh, present an ideal setting to study the proposed uh, research questions. Uh, and then uh, I used uh, a survey to collect data from flight plan managers at the county level in Virginia. The final sample size was 59 cities and counties. Um, and I used the uh, Arduino scales to measure the factors in the survey. And uh, then I used this data to run logistic regression models to analyze data. Uh, here are here is the detailed information about variables. The dependent variable is buyout adoption, uh, and the independent variable include uh, internal factors and external factors. Specifically, hazard uh, problem variables include two variables. They are repetitive flood loss and property damage. Uh, and uh, as for social vulnerability, I used uh, the social vulnerability index from CDC as the indicator for this variable. Uh, and in individual capacity variable include the indicators of uh, flood plan um, managers hazard mitigation working experience, awareness of flood risk and buyout benefits and innovative ability. Organizational capacity focus on uh, government itself and so, uh, system capacity uh, refers to the cooperations between local governments and uh, organizations within a county. Uh, as for external factors, the policy diffusion has uh, policy learning as the indicator, which means uh, a locality can learn buyouts from other localities. Policy environment uh, refers to the collaborations between state, federal, and local governments. And here is the table with the final results. Uh, we can see that individual capacity and repetitive flooding laws are the significant factors that influence local governments to adapt uh, uh, the property buyout program. Uh, in details, uh, the results supports hypothesis one. Uh, which means there is a positive relationship between repetitive flood loss and buyout adoption at the local level. However, uh, the property damage variable is not statistically significant to influence the buyout adoption at the local level. With respect to social vulnerability, the results uh, uh, do not support hypothesis two. Um, one possible reason is that the overall ranking of um, social factors represents the social vulnerability index, but uh, not all of them are related to flood issues and weaken the key social factor effects. Uh, as for individual capacity, the results support uh, hypothesis three which means there is a positive relationship between individual capacity and buyout adoption at the local level. Uh, and uh, this is also means that uh, floodplain managers with more hazard, mi hazard mitigation working experience, awareness of flood risk and buyout benefits and innovative ability can enhance community buy-in and political will for local governments to take up the property buyout policy. Uh, however, the results of organizational capacity and system cap capacity do not support hypothesis four and five. Uh, this can be explained by the characteristics of buyout program. Since famous property uh, buyout projects are cost reimbursement projects, they require a larger amount of monies to uh, complete. So local governments need needs to uh, seek various funding resources instead of relying on government itself. Uh, and at the same time, local government as a sub-grantee of FEMA funded buyouts, uh, they are in charge of the buyout policy adoption processes, which means other organizations or the public in a locality cannot make decision 
in this policy adoption process. In terms of external factors, policy diffusion and policy environment are not significant factors that can influence buyout adoption. Um, this is because FEMA's buyout program is a voluntary policy and each locality has its own characteristics to decide uh, if the locality take up the property buyout uh, and uh, it cannot be influenced by other localities. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, a lack of um, transparency about the approval criteria and subjective cost benefit analysis uh, of the property buyout uh, program uh, make this uh, adoption process more complicated. And uh, there are two limitations for this research. Uh, first, uh, since in current research, I used uh, a survey to collect data and uh, I conduct uh, quantitative research methods to analyze data uh, in order to explore more information about how and why local governments uh, adopt uh, the property buyout program, I need to conduct uh, qualitative research in the future. Uh, another limitation is that uh, since uh, the sample size was limited, uh, I have to assume that counties and towns had similar internal dynamics, but uh, it's, it may not be true in reality. Uh, in summary, uh, this study provides a theoretical framework as the foundation uh, for powerful analytical structures and simplify uh, complex policy adoption dynamics. Uh, and uh, this research also provides um, evidence that local governments with more flood plan managers who have flood mitigation experience awareness of flood risk and buyout benefits and policy innovative ability will be likely to take up the property buyout policy in order to reduce flood risk in a locality. And here is the link of the report. You can download it from the website. Okay, this is all about my research. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Chung. So uh, as a reminder, any questions for Chung, please just drop in the Q&A and we will get to those in some manner throughout the webinar or following the webinar. Now over to you, Sherry and Ronnie. Great, thanks, Courtney. Um, we're uh, happy to be here today. Thank you so much for the invitation um, to share a little bit about a study we've been working on looking at mitigation policy after wildfire in California. Um, so Ronnie and I are here representing our broader team, which includes um, Miranda Mochran of the Forest Service and Alex Greer at SUNY Albany as well. Um, so let me go to the next slide, Ronnie, thank you. Okay, so um, just to start with a little bit of background, what brought us to this work? Um, it was really this guiding question, where do we see tension between recovery goals um, and mitigation goals, both in terms of policy and practice, that distance between policy and practice, um, and also at different um, levels of uh, governance. So essentially, uh, we know that in this case, we're looking at uh, wildfires, so kind of in the wake of fires, um, policymakers really have to balance um, speedy recovery, right, this sort of need or push for a speedy recovery um, with measures that can help reduce uh, fire exposure going forward. So what we really wanted to do with this study was to um, explore these tensions um, a little bit more in depth. Uh, so in terms of our study area, we are looking at three counties in Northern California. You can see um, mapped out here. Um, and we selected these three counties because they have one um, important thing in common, which is that they have all experienced um, high, um, highly destructive fires in recent years, kind of, we, we started at 2015 and they're looking uh, from that time forward. Um, but they also varied on some uh, important factors. So they varied in terms of their population size and density, uh, the proportion of housing in the Woolier and the wildland urban in interface, um, and also uh, varied in, in terms of affluence. Uh, so the three counties we selected here are Sonoma, Lake, and Butte. Um, you may not 
be familiar with these counties in particular, but I'll just mention a couple fires that might ring a bell. So Sonoma County uh, experienced the Tubbs fire in 2017. Um, Lake County, uh, you might be familiar with the Valley Fire uh, that was uh, just really devastating in that area in 2015. Um, and then Butte County is uh, where the campfire occurred in 2018, which is the fire that destroyed paradise and the surrounding um, areas. So for our study, what we did is essentially interview um, 37 participants made up of uh, local uh, and state um, stakeholders, community leaders, government officials, and a handful of university representatives and consultants um, to try to get at this uh, question that we were looking to answer. Um, this was supposed to all be done in person, but of course it was done over Zoom because that's the world we still live in um, to some degree. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we want to do today is uh, just present some findings from this study, and we'll talk a little bit about what's next, but uh, we will pre present the findings in two sections. So one is looking at some cross-cutting themes across our three counties, and then we'll touch briefly on some kind of county-specific um, findings as well. So starting with the cross-cutting themes, um, the thing that really rose to uh, the top, and this might not be surprising, was this issue of housing. So in, in all three of these counties, um, there were significant housing shortages before these fires ever occurred. So that was just kind of part of the reality, um, uh, you know, pre-fire. Pre after the fires, uh, what we really saw were um, communities that were really struggling to balance um, a suite of state and in some cases federal requirements. So things like regional housing needs assessments that said, hey, county, you must create X units of new housing every year. Um, things like uh, limitations on development in the WUI. Um, so kind of trying to balance these state and federal requirements with uh, community needs with the, the kind of local needs to recover quickly and also to uh, implement appropriate uh, mitigation measures at that local level. So there were some real conflicts in terms of uh, priorities in these areas. And uh, another cross-cutting theme just to pick up on that in that vein is vegetation management, which of course we know is essential in managing fuels um, here in the wake of wildfires and preventing future wildfires from spreading. There is a growing acceptance we found of a number of vegetation management techniques and using them in combination wherever possible. Um, but the big uh, problem was really scaling up to meet the challenge at hand. And the scaling issues took a variety of, um, uh, of pathways, really. We saw them in, per, in pertaining to CEQA. So that would be the California Environmental Quality Act and getting the necessary environmental clearances to be able to begin these type of large scale uh, landscape treatments. We saw fragmented ownership, which uh, depending on the county, uh, our interviewees talked about this a little bit different, but fragmented ownership, either in terms of public private uh, lands next to one another or very rugged terrain, and, and we're all limiting factors here. And then the decreasing number of opportunities throughout the year with the warming and drying climate, um, because there are certain humidity controls uh, that need to be in place uh, before actually undertaking controlled burns. So that was another limiting factor. The third theme um, was interesting in that it threaded through both of the other two themes. So economic development was always a concern when thinking about recovery. So um, economic development was threaded through the conversation a little bit differently in each of our three counties. So in Sonoma County, the focus really was on providing affordable housing and the economics of developing the infrastructure to support the number of accessory dwelling units that were coming up post fire that's being seen as a very easy way of achieving those housing goals. In Butte County, the conversation over economic development really took more of a sustainability term and how can we make vegetation management economically viable. Um, and in Lake County, both housing and vegetation management threaded through conversations about economic development in terms of uh, using cannabis revenues for risk reduction um, and, and a bit about uh, uh, wildfire wooey building regulations. Where do we actually put this new development if the state is saying we can't build in wooey areas? And we'll turn now to some county specific themes. So Sherry, do you want to 
start with Sonoma? Sure. So uh, in Sonoma County, there was a, a, a very clear emphasis on streamlining recovery um, and also importantly, the resources to do that well. Um, so they were able to, for example, um, outsource uh, portions of their permitting process so that they could kind of really move that uh, process of rebuilding housing um, along very quickly. Uh, there was a focus on making housing recovery um, operations really fast, really efficient, and really flexible. And that's just kind of what we heard, um, you know, over and over in that particular area. Um, so that's all well and good, but it does kind of raise this bigger question, right, of um, does this emphasis on speed and efficiency uh, facilitate, facilitate, excuse me, or inhibit uh, mitigation in this context? Um, and then Butte County is a really interesting area because it was really characterized by the strong sense of place. Um, and there were specific ties to uh, the Ponderosa pine forest in this area. And you'll see, uh, we have a couple of photos here just kind of showing that particular tree um, being uh, well loved and embraced by the community. They're, you know, these beautiful forests um, that are reflected in, you know, all over the county, all over the community. Um, but, uh, these beautiful Ponderosa forests are also the same forests that really fueled the campfire. And so again, it raises um, this kind of big, important and um, challenging question of in places like Butte, um, can we preserve this um, strong sense of place um, in the context of a changing climate? And in Lake County, um, Lake County was a complicated place. Um, it, it's, if you've ever been there, uh, many of you probably have not, but it's hemmed in by mountains on all sides. So it is very isolated geographically, and it's a very under-resourced uh, county. So there was limited capacity at the local government level to really um, address some of the mitigation needs. Um, there were about seven fires and two floods in this span of seven years from 2015 till the time that we were speaking with um, our, our participants from that, that county. So really, they, they emphasized that the county had been in crisis mode for quite some time and that there was chronic attrition in local government. So that, of course, also didn't help with the institutional capacity to deal with this. Um, at the same time, from one end of Lake County to the other, there are some extreme socioeconomic disparities. Um, so what's happened in Lake County was interesting in that it was a really a series of hyper-local organizations, a lot of voluntary uh, organizations, firewise, fire safe communities, and uh, local governing councils that have arisen to try and meet these needs, but it does beg the question, how well can these hyper-local networks uh, deal systematically with the challenges of wildfire risk reduction at the larger level? So each of these uh, counties really presents some interesting um, questions for future research, but I wanna emphasize four key tensions that we were able to identify. These are definitely preliminary in that we weren't able to dig down quite deep enough to look at the conflicts between individual policies, but I think these broadly frame some of the next steps and where we're headed. So we definitely heard a lot about conflicts between state and local level governance, both in terms of perspectives on uh, vulnerability and meeting those um, challenges of housing, vegetation management, and economic development concurrently. Um, there were also differences in how locals decided to prioritize those, uh, those challenges versus uh, state level officials. We heard a lot about environmental regulations and those tend to slow down uh, recovery so the recovery of the built environment, the recovery of the natural environment and mitigation, specifically fuels management. Um, so slowing down being of course counter to that goal of speedy recovery. Um, we heard a lot about recovery resources being siphoned from one jurisdiction to the next. And really this is um, a product of wildfires being such a chronic hazard in this region and a repetitive hazard. Um, we heard a lot of this uh, with Lake and Sonoma County in particular because the Valley Fire happened about two years prior to the Nuns, Tubbs, Pocket Fires of 2017. So, uh, you know, Lake County right next door, lower socioeconomic status, the, the house values are not as high. Um, they found that a lot of the contractors were siphoned off to do rebuilding in Napa and Sonoma. Um, also just 
attention was focused away from that area. And a lot of the resources that were coming from nonprofit agencies were also uh, moved to those other areas that were impacted by more recent fires. Finally, um, this last point gets at kind of where we're going next with this project. So beyond kind of digging a little deeper into the policy, we want to look at wildfire mitigation at a very fine spatial scale. What really struck us since, uh, you know, many on the team have, have done flood research, hurricane research, wildfires are this really vexing hazard to mitigate because they require collective action at very, very fine spatial scales. So we're talking, you know, a neighborhood of 10 houses, one house isn't built with fire resistant materials, uh, one house isn't maintaining the non combustible zone or, or maintaining their vegetation, and suddenly that's the threat to the entire neighborhood where nine out of 10 homeowners might actually be doing what they need to do in terms of mitigation. So the amount of collective action and cooperation is, uh, is really, really localized. So with that in mind, we thought the next appropriate step would be to turn now to looking at residents and really talking to residents about how they understand these risks um, in the context of recent fires and looking specifically at place attachment as an organizing framework. So how do uh, connections to place affect the decision to rebuild and to rebuild as your home was before, to rebuild and somehow mitigate or better prepare? Uh, or to throw in the towel and relocate. So we've recently gotten some funding from the National Science Foundation to uh, begin to answer this question in Northern California. We're focusing on those three same study communities in large part because they, they represent that gamut of urban to rural type communities. Of course, we can't select every county in Northern California to focus on. So we're zooming in to really get that local context. So that's where we are and that's where we're headed uh, currently in the recruiting phase there. So that's all for us and we welcome your questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sherry and Ronnie. And now over to Divya and again, <clears throat> excuse me, keep putting your questions in the Q&A. This is fantastic. We will make sure one way or the other, we get to all of your questions. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, welcome to everybody who's here. Good morning. My name is Divya Chandrasekhar. I am here presenting on the behalf of Sua Kim, who is a PhD candidate who works with B in my department. Um, she is the PI and the lead author on this paper, but she could not be here, and hence, this is me. Uh, we're talking today about small businesses, which I don't know if many of you know, but are actually the back backbone of our US economy. Most businesses in the US are actually small businesses. Um, and about half of Americans are employed by these businesses, and they contribute to pretty much everything that makes our economy run at the local level, from jobs to revenue to just general uh, impetus to grow. Uh, and by small businesses, we mean businesses with 500 or less employees, which I know sounds like a big number, but this depends on the industry. So manufacturing, for instance, that's at the higher end of this uh, zero to 500, whereas, say, professional technical services are smaller. So small businesses in general are really a very powerful engine for the US economy. But unfortunately, this engine is really, really vulnerable to disasters. Small businesses tend to be the least prepared when it comes to withstanding disasters. They have less capital flows. They tend to not do business planning. They don't do much financial planning. They don't prepare for or, or do mitigation much at all. And they lack literacy, literacy just basic uh, financial literacy to be able to apply for AIDS or before or after disaster. Uh, and a lot of this is based on the resource constraints that small businesses face. They just don't have the resources, whether it's financial or technical, to undertake a lot of the preparation required for disasters. And this is where recovery programs can step in. Business recovery programs provide that aid, provide that resource that could help a business go from just recovering to building back better so that they are better prepared for the next time. And this is a very important role of mitigation and recovery as we've heard before, you know, mitigation being a very important aspect that you can pursue through this recovery, the resource rich recovery moment. And in turn, you can be more resilient. But the question remains whether business recovery programs actually promote mitigation during the process of recovery and, and therefore lead to more resilient businesses. When we talk about mitigation in small businesses, we're really referring to three types of actions. The first is basic what people think, 
of when we think of mitigation, which is usually structural mitigation. Things like elevating your utilities or elevating your stock, you know, reconstructing your building to be stronger, retrofitting, maybe even relocation. But it could also include things like insurance, disaster insurance, which are pretty specific to a hazard type, or even business interruption insurance, which ensures that you can actually make payroll during your, the moment that your business is not working. But you could also do things that are just good business practices that strengthen the way your business operates. And this results in you being more resilient to disasters. Things like working capital enhancements, you could do supply chain analysis, just continuity planning, or even just get financial counseling. Learn how to work your business better. And these kinds of actions are really important to promote during the recovery process so that we can then make businesses stronger for the next time. And so the question that we posed was, if we are going to be giving money to businesses for recovering, which we do, to what extent is this money being used to make them resilient, not just recovered? And what are the opportunities of pursuing this kind of mitigation focus in recovery programs? What helps and what is the barrier here? And we did this in two phases. The first phase was to look for actual programs. We focused on four case studies, New York and New Jersey in Hurricane uh, North Carolina after Hurricane Matthew, and Texas after Hurricane Harvey. And we started at the state level, and then we looked at programs, uh, federal level, state level, county levels, and uh, city levels. And we found about 72 programs across all four case studies, which were business, small business recovery programs. And we analyzed those for how they were administered, how they were funded, what type they were, whether they were grant, loan, or technical assistance programs, and to what extent they actually talked about mitigation as a use of funds. And then we paired that with uh, key informant interviews. This is still ongoing. We've got about nine interviews as of now, and we are still continuing to do more. Um, these interviews are with federal, state, and local officials in economic development organizations or with chambers of commerce and also nonprofits that we realized were working with some small businesses in these areas. And these were of course, open-ended semi-structured. They focused a lot on why or to what extent mitigation is considered part of recovery or how certain programs were designed and how they were implemented. So what we found from our review of programs, the 72 programs, but actually most programs are local programs. They're administered by local organizations, local agencies, but they are done using federal funds. And not only is that 33% directly fund, you know, federal funding, but the combined sources, a lot of programs are run is using a mix of sources, some state money, some nonprofit money, some federal money, which basically means that federal funding constitutes more than 33% and more almost a dominant source of funding for small business recovery in the US. So it's a really, really important source of funding, federal funds, but that these are delivered locally. Another interesting finding was that most of the programs we found were grant programs, which goes a little against what typically literature tells us, that, uh, that, that funding for businesses is usually loans, which increases debt burden of, of uh, businesses. It's a common critique of federal funding. But in our grant, in our programs, we found more grant programs. And we really puzzled over this for a while till we realized that the grant uh, programs typically gave out smaller amounts of money and that loan programs tended to be bigger amounts of money. So even though the number of programs are higher in, in grant versus loans, loans probably or possibly uh, represent a larger resource pool than grant programs. Just something to keep in mind as we go further. In terms of whether they actually promote mitigation, the big question that we asked here, is recovery programming doing enough to promote mitigation? The answer is generally no. Most programs, in fact, make no mention of mitigation activities. One of those three topics that we listed before, structure uh, mo modifications to structures, insurance, or business operation um, actions. They make absolutely no mention of it. That's 76% uh, of the programs. Uh, about 24% of them do mention thing, you know, making um, or doing mitigation activities as an eligible use of funds. Uh, of that, only five actually require the business to undertake a specific mitigation action as part of the recovery programming. So they would list it, for example, as a required use of the money. 
uh, 19% of them would list mitigation actions as eligible uses of money, but not required. Now, an important thing to note here is that when we talk about the required use of funding, programs that required that businesses use the money to undertake a mitigation action, all of those actions were structural modifications. Almost none of the programs required them to undertake things like buying business insurance or to do continuity planning or any of the operational levels. So mitigation seems to be very closely, narrowly defined as structural mitigation. The other interesting thing that we found is that all these programs, the 5% programs are all local programs. These are not federal or state programs. But if you look at all the programs that local organizations offer, they tended to also be the least mitigation focused, which means that local level programs tend to be on two polar, polar ends. Either they are all gung-ho, all in about mitigation as part of recovery, or they don't talk about it at all. And this dichotomy is also reflected in the next finding, which is about why or why are there not, or why are there only a few programs that actually talk about mitigation? And uh, each level of government seems to have its own challenge. So the federal level, a lot of conversation was about just policy constraints. SBA, for example, Small Business Administration is a loan granting organization. It doesn't do grants. And so it doesn't, it cannot do certain things that we would like it to do, right? Changing the program would require legislative action. And that's just too hard. The other thing, the interesting thing is that even though some of the programs do provide mitigation funding, it limits the definition of mitigation and hazard. Um, a classic example also is SBA, for example, even though SBA funds can be used to mitigate against a hazard, it can only be used to mitigate against the hazard you have experienced and not all the hazards that you may experience. At the state level, a lot of these, pro these programs actually inherit the same federal policy problems because most federal programs are run through the state. But they also struggle with the issue of local match, which is uh, by, for some federal programs, it's up to 25%, uh, has to be put up by local, by local agencies and state agencies actually help local agencies to do that work. There's a lot of conversation about local match problems. At the local level, as I mentioned before, there's just a complete diversity of conversations around mitigation. Either they are, they are all for it, they say that mitigation is really important and we require it, or they say we haven't thought about it at all. Uh, we didn't think about doing mitigation for small business recovery. We just thought we should give the money to repair and move on. And so there seems to be a lot of unequal understanding about what it means to do recovery and mitigation and how it might be related to resilience. In terms of opportunities, well, the federal level the officials and state departments, they are all agreed that mitigation is really important for recovery. There's a lot of conversation about the study that talks about for every $1 of mitigation, you save $6 of recovery. So there, there's a lot of agreement at the federal level on this topic. At the state level, they talked a lot about the flexibility of CDBGDR money, which is the Community Block Development Recovery Grant uh, money, which is a lot more flexible and which can allow them to incorporate things like mitigation actions into recovery. But they also talked about other things like just having economic development strategies that could be used or could be paired with recovery funding to then have a more holistic recovery policy. So for example, some states have supply chain analysis tools that they could just offer to businesses to use. And if the recovery programming doesn't allow it, well, economic development programs can step in. And at the local level, there was a lot of conversation about easy leveraging of government nonprofit relationships and that fact that this allowed some local organizations to circumvent the problem around inflexibility or legislative or policy constraints. And the, there's also, of all the levels, the greatest investment in local development or local economic development at this level. And so they are really invested in things that help improve the economy. So this is an opportunity to talk to them about it. And so what we can conclude is that recovery programs in general seem to be a missed opportunity to help small businesses mitigate against future disasters. We are not doing enough. We're not pushing this agenda enough, especially in this resource-rich moment, one, the moment when businesses have more money than they've ever had before. We need to be able to pursue mitigation during this moment. And the reasons for this oversight really differ across various levels, but they range from things like funding and policy constraints to just lack of understanding of how various mitigation, resilience, and 
recovery concepts are interlinked and that we need to have this conversation a lot more and more. And so as we move forward, what we really need to do is we need to break this silo between economic development and recovery because there are lots of good things happening on each end that could provide a more integrated approach for business recovery. We also need to coordinate message, you know, messaging of the link or what, how you can pursue resilience through recovery across all levels of government. And we should be partnered in nonprofits a little bit more just because they have the, the power of flexible funding, which uh, federal and state programs don't usually have. And with that, I just want to have, give a word of thanks to the Mitigation Matters Program and also to uh, the Native American tribes of Utah that allow us to do the research that we do at the University of Utah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Divya. Um, if you could stop sharing right now, I think what we'll do now is we'll open it up for Q&A. The presenters have done such a beautiful job of answering questions as they come in. So I think um, I had some things queued up and then you beautifully answered uh, those questions. So what I think I'll do instead is um, ask each of you uh, a specific question and then we will for any questions that are still coming in that you can drop in the Q&A. Again, follow up with the presenters and make sure that we post those responses to our webpage. Any of the answers that you're in the process of typing, as I can see on my screen, some things are actively in the process of being answered, please feel free to go ahead with that. So I'm gonna go in order, first with Chung and then Ronnie, Sherry, and Divya, and just ask each of you the same question. In light of the findings that you have from this important research, what do you think would be the follow-on study, specifically looking at, would you change anything about your methodological approach? Would you change anything about the subgroups or communities or areas or unit of measure? Um, what is it that you think this research is, is saying about some really important next steps for each of you? Chung? Yes, thank you for asking that question. Uh, in my next stage, I will conduct uh, interviews with experts um, from uh, local governments or state government uh, or nonprofit organizations and universities in Virginia to continue my study on the adoption of buyout at the local level. Uh, in this way, I think I can collect uh, more detailed information about what factors influence local governments to adapt uh, the property buyout policy. Uh, and uh, uh, in the future, I think uh, one of the potential direction for me is to conduct a research on market-based uh, uh, buyout policy. For example, uh, since I'm a uh, Virginia Sea Grant fellow, I'm working with the planners in the city of Norfolk. Uh, they are working on modifying their innovative zoning ordinance and uh, market-based buyout is part of their zoning ordinance. And the planners working is work are working with uh, Whitelands Watch, uh, which is a, um, a nonprofit organization to uh, develop market based uh, buyout projects uh, currently. So I think uh, this is, might be a one possible uh, innovative way to um, conduct a buyouts in the future. Great, thank you. Just, just a follow-on question to that. Do you have plans to continue to utilize or modify the conceptual framework? Yeah, yeah. I will uh, modify my conceptual work based on the previous findings. Great, thank, you. thank you. And Ronnie and Sherry, same question. As a reminder, I can tell you, um, so anything that you think is an important follow-on study, specifically around uh, changes you might make to methodological approaches, area, unit of analysis, subgroups. Great, thanks, Courtney. So um, I can I can start, Ronnie, and then uh, feel free to jump in if that works. So I know we, we touched a little bit on uh, the next phase of our research um, that's uh, just kind of getting going now. Um, and so one of the things that we really wanted to do building off of this mitigation matters work uh, was to uh, 
augment our work looking kind of at the policy level um, and, and getting an understanding of the, you know, those, the relationship between, um, you know, the state and local level kind of decision making priorities, uh, gaps, challenges, etc. Um, and really uh, start to, to look more closely at, um, you know, in that in that kind of ecosystem of decision making and experience, what does it look like to be a resident? Um, kind of, you know, facing these very real, very urgent, you know, very kind of right now questions about, um, you know, there are questions about balancing recovery and mitigation, though no resident would ever necessarily put them in those terms. And so that's why we want to um, look at uh, basically how residents are making these kind of big post-event decisions. Um, you know, do they rebuild? their home exactly the way it was? Do they rebuild with mitigation measures in place um, or do they relocate? And of course, within that, there's this whole, um, you know, kind of world of complexity, right? So it's 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 easy even for our, our resident participants to say, sure, I want to mitigate, um, but gosh, is that expensive, right? Or, <laughs> um, or gosh, I, can I, you know, is, isn't it hard to get, you know, the proper contractors in to do X, Y, Z that um, needs to be done to my property, um, you know, or, you know, uh, as we were mentioning, you know, it's great to do X, Y, Z to my property, but what really matters is what my neighbors are doing as well and what supports do they have and what access do they have. Um, so I think that's a piece of it is kind of, you know, bringing in that resident experience. Um, I think, you know, a little bit more broadly, part of what we're trying to understand. So we're looking here at fires. Um, most of our team has worked primarily on floods and hurricanes, as Ronnie mentioned, um, but kind of in the same overarching set of questions about, um, you know, what what happens, <laughs> like what happens after these sort of major um, disaster events uh, that cause people to make, uh, you know, different decisions or that, you know, people have to kind of make decisions in really challenging contexts. So um, that's part of what we're trying to look at is just how to, you know, how do fires and floods relate and where are they different? And, um, you know, in thinking about policy and practice, where can we learn lessons across those, you know, that kind of divide um, and where, you know, where are things really distinctive? Um, so we're, you know, kind of digging in right now to place attachment as one piece that we think does cross those boundaries. It is something that's uh, very real and important and still not particularly well understood um, in any of those contexts, but worth our time. Yeah, and, and in that vein, and not to be labor, I, I agree, yes, with everything Sherry said. I think that the, the appealing part of place attachment is, is kind of going there and being in that location. Um, you know, one thing that we had to pivot, uh, we, we proposed this study, I think at the very tail end of 2019, getting funding in place in early 2020, and then immediately, you know, had to pivot to Zoom interviews without the benefit of having gone to these study communities. And you, as you saw from our presentation, we were finally able to make it there um, in September of this year to each of our study counties and start meeting the local, you know, partners and kind of working there. Um, there's a lot of power in, in touring these communities. And that was originally a part of what we had planned to do with finding out, okay, who are those community organizations? Who are the neighborhood organizations? And actually having them do basically transect walks with us to show us how mitigation was being put into practice. And we're only now starting to see those things. I think using photo voice as a tool to let residents articulate and show that visually, visually is, uh, is incredibly powerful and it will add something to this study, especially considering the importance of that, that natural environment relationship and looking at the wildfire problem. Great, thanks so much. Um, this is lots of exciting uh, possibilities. And Divya? As Courtney, my study was a little different, <laughs> focusing on small businesses, of course, but uh, there are many things that require a little bit more investigation. But one thing we don't leave, we've only interviewed the officials, we haven't actually interviewed businesses yet. And so Sua's work in her dissertation is focused on businesses. And so she's been doing surveys and interviews. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm answering for Sua because she's not here but I am her advisor, so I can tell you a little bit. Uh, she is focused on businesses, so that dissertation helps, it's paired with the studies, like the subsequent uh, as, uh, sort of follow-up of this specific study and looks at how they're recovering and what kind of decisions they make for mitigation and for preparedness, but also specifically at how they use relationships and social capital in as part of the recovery. And, uh, and this is actually one of the things that uh, really is very important to dig into is and also probably describes why we don't do a lot of mitigation recovery is that we think of 
businesses as economic units and only as economic units and specifically small businesses, whereas actually all small business research tends to indicate they tend to think of themselves as social units. They are part of the community. They are typically residents of the community, but also business owners. And so they have a lot more investment and place attachment and all the things that we have good things that we've heard here. They have all of those things in addition to having to work on their on this business. Um, but policy doesn't see that. And policy tends to say, if we just give them a little bit of money, they'll be back on track and they'll start you know, running again, but that's not necessarily true. So in some ways, having a more holistic approach is really, really important. Um, here's, I might as well answer Laurie's question. Laurie put a question in the chat saying, you know, can, how can we offer more inclusive understanding of mitigation beyond the building? And I think this is the problem is that we tend to think of damage as a very limited thing and resilience to something in specific, you know, aspects. So we tend to think of mitigation as a structural problem, but mitigation is about preventing impact and impact holistically designed or defined is more than just the building. It is the building, but it's also the life or the economy that actually operates in, the, you know, in that building. And so we have to expand our understanding of how we think about mitigation. Uh, and that if when it comes to businesses, that means thinking beyond just the actual physical store, but thinking about how businesses operate. And you see, economic development agencies already do that. They don't think about the building as much as they think about the business. And so it makes for a natural pairing, but which we don't do. As I said, we need to do more of that. Great, thank you. I really appreciate you uh, sharing those insights and it's, it's very thought provoking. Um, I just wanna thank everyone again. I just have a few concluding remarks. Again, we wanna thank FEMA and we wanna thank the National Science Foundation for making the research award program and the webinar series possible. Um, thanks to each of you for joining us today. And um, I think it's evidenced by the quality of these presentations. Again, we've had 19 Mitigation Matters research teams. This is our third Mitigation Matters research specific webinar. And um, I think it's really obvious how important the work is and how much the work is, is so applied and can make a difference. And in light of this in particular, I'm very pleased to share that thanks to the support from FEMA, we will be able to offer another round of funding to the Mitigation Matters Research Award Program. So that is very exciting. And um, again, before we close, a few brief announcements. So as a reminder, please access our website to learn more about the research shared today. This was just a little bit of a, a taste test, a little appetizer in these 15 minute presentations, but you can read uh, the presenters full reports as well as their research briefs on our website. And if you attended the live webinar for its duration, please contact Katie Murphy at the Haas Center at colorado.edu uh, email. Again, this is going to be dropped into the chat to receive your certificate of attendance and specify whether you want continuing education credits from ASFPM or IAEM. Please sign up also for updates and that's updates so you can receive notifications on future webinars, training sessions, also funding opportunities from Natural Hazard Center. And um, excitingly, please save the date. Um, we have our next Making Mitigation work webinar series February 14th from 11 to 12 MST. You can find out more on our website. And for now, uh, on behalf of the entire Natural Hazards Center team, we again thank you, the panelists, and all of the participants for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. That was Thanks, great. Everyone. And thank you, Courtney, for all the leadership of the program and great presentations. Thank you. I hope, all, all. I hope we answered all the questions. If not, yeah. people can please email me.